Hi everyone, my name is Stephanie Mehta. I'm Editor-in-Chief at Fast Company, and I'm excited today to be speaking with Michael Meebach, Chief Executive Officer of MasterCard and a member of its Board of Directors. Michael joined MasterCard in 2010 to lead its Middle East and Africa operations, and over the past five years, first in his role as Chief Product Officer, then as President, and now as CEO, a role he took on at the beginning of the year, Michael has been leading the company's efforts to apply technology and data analytics to its core financial services business. So he's the perfect person to talk about the role that technology can play in bridging or exacerbating technological and digital divides. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, Stephanie. Exciting topic, a lot of facets around it. Great. Well, most people in the Aspen Ideas Festival audience are familiar with MasterCard, the global brand, your business. But I'm not sure everyone is quite aware of how financial inclusion has been a through line of the company. Can you talk about the role that financial inclusion plays in MasterCard's mission and business operations? Yeah, happy to talk about that. Um, it's, um, you know, financial inclusion matters deeply at MasterCard, but you know, it's not obvious why that would be. So uh, let me just tell you a little bit and everybody who's watching this on what we're actually about. So MasterCard is not a credit card company. That's the first thing I should just make clear out there. So we are a, um, a technology company, a technology company that has grown up in the payment space. Um, fintech, original fintech, I would say. Um, there's three billion people out there that find ways to pay and receive money holding a MasterCard payment credential in some form or fashion, digital wallet, feature phone, actually on a piece of plastic, all of that. So that is, Generally, the business model, uh, we make something very complex, fairly simple for a lot of people and a lot of businesses for that matter. When the company IPO'd in 2006, um, a good chunk of our initial stock went to create uh, a foundation, the MasterCard Foundation, which is now an independent uh, foundation, one of the most significant private foundations out there. That's a cornerstone of some of the philanthropic efforts that you know MasterCard is um, um, is promoting and supporting. Um, in the company itself, we do a lot of that, try to make a difference beyond our business and the communities that we serve. And that's where financial inclusion um, comes in, but it's not a philanthropic exercise as such. If you think about what we do, we connect people, we facilitate payments, we help people um, live a better financial life. And that's right where the link to our business is. And I've always believed that if you link whatever you do to try to make a difference to your commercial viability, then it is scalable. So that's how the link comes in, why financial inclusion matters. And it has mattered for years and years and years. Michael, share a little bit with our audience the experience you had running Middle East and Africa for MasterCard and how that shaped your views and understanding of the issues around financial inclusion. Yeah. You know, I spent an, a, a decade being involved with Africa and talk about a seismic uh, shock to my system. So you show up, you think you have the recipe, here's how it should work, because that's what I've done the last 15 years and you find none of what you thought works actually does work. Um, you know, the starting point of, okay, you know, what will work? Start to ask the people, what are you actually trying to solve? Ask governments. At the time, we had a minimal business in Middle East Africa that was really targeted to facilitate you know, the affluent travel um, needs. And today, we have a thriving business in the domestic economy, you know, having pulled a lot of people into uh, the system. So it all started with understanding what will work. And, uh, basic infrastructure wasn't there. So you needed offline solutions. You needed to deploy technology in a totally different way. The way that left me as a leader um, thereafter is don't assume anything. Be humble enough to say that you don't know the answer and then work with folks to figure out the answer. And you know, when I then moved over here, that was exceedingly helpful because now the world is changing so fast that the recipe still might not work again. No? There are some really interesting examples that we've seen from emerging markets, um, and not just the technologically advanced emerging markets yeah. like the Indias and, and Chinas of the world, but are there examples of technologies or solutions you deployed in the Middle East and Africa that you think are applicable to the developed world? Oh, absolutely, uh, absolutely. So you know, I give you an example 
that uh, is faced in many types of markets around the world, and it's the question on how somebody goes to market and sells their goods or services. Oftentimes, that's through a middleman. And the middleman cuts out a lot of, you know, it could be a wholesaler, it could be somebody who takes quite a chunk of the profit of a small business. That could be in a, in a developed market or in an emerging market. We've created something called the MasterCard Farmers Network. It basically allows a farmer to find price transparency and go to the market and sell at the best possible price in a direct access fashion. That kind of a model, that's what you see in the shared economy these days, and that was one of the early examples of what, what we exported. Many more examples. We put a lab into Nairobi, try to come up with new cool stuff that we could use elsewhere. So the leapfrogging capability of emerging markets is definitely there and something that we leverage as much as we can. In emerging markets, there are lots of examples of digitization, replacing cash as currency, yeah. and, and, and really helping bring more participants into the financial mainstream. Talk a little bit about the role of digitization of currency and, and what role you've seen that play in terms of, of bridging some of those divides. Yeah, you know, um, in emerging markets anywhere else in the world, um, you see this accelerated race towards a more digital uh, economy. Oftentimes, economy uh, you know, evolves pretty much all the time. It evolves the uh, exchange of something. A payment will take place if you do not have a financial identity. Um, and you're trying to do this in cash, oftentimes you cannot transact. It just doesn't happen. If you're stuck in a cash economy, your reach is not there. If you want to be in a digital economy, you don't have a digital identity. None of that really works. So we needed to find answers to, to pull people in. You know, back in the day, uh, this was the initial days of starting QR codes because a terminal on a till wasn't the answer. That cost $500. How is that ever going to work? Stick a QR code at the back of the corner shop and you're in business. Prepaid cards, mobile money, digital wallets, crypto, there's the journey and there's always a new emerging technology that we lean into. And um, you know, digitization plays as much of a role um, of currency in, in emerging markets as in developed markets. You mentioned digital identity as mm -hmm. being a, a barrier. What are some of the other areas where we have to be really careful to make sure that digitization doesn't exclude people? Where are the risks associated with thinking of technology as a panacea? Yes. Um, you know, my starting point uh, always is we have the technology. So that is actually not the problem. So if you deploy it in the right way, it could make a real difference. Um, if you deploy it in the wrong way, it can have unintended side consequences. A good example is so the power of, assume you have data, raw, the raw material, and then how do you manipulate the data in a form that a consumer or a business can benefit from their own data? Use machine learning, use artificial intelligence. Well, if the artificial, artificial intelligence algorithm is biased, then you might have an unintended consequence. Your access to credit might not be as good as you should actually be having to. So making sure there is no bias, having a diverse set of data scientists, make sure your algorithms are constantly checked. That's one way and one important way that we look at AI and others should as well. Data privacy is another way. Uh, we say your data is misused and you don't even know about that as a consumer. Um, I could go on and on. In the end, it is not the technologies, it's the whole experience that matters. So you start back with the people, what are they actually trying to do and how has this thing, uh, how does this thing work end to end vis-a-vis -vis there's a piece of interesting cool technology in the middle. I love that personally, but the whole thing has to work. Yeah. Well, and you raise an interesting issue around algorithmic bias and, and some of the mm -hmm. challenges there. I mean, so many of the people creating technologies are very privileged. They're educated. They're highly, they're among the elite. And yet we are trying to serve communities that are underserved. Yeah. Do, do you have thoughts on how we make sure that the technology really is addressing the needs of people who may not necessarily look like the technologists programming it? I think, first of all, you have to ensure that diversity of thinking um, in a technology company is everywhere. Um, I firmly believe an off-the-shelf solution from here in New York will not be the answer in Indonesia. Um, so we have shifted out our innovation um, all around the world, much closer to the customer, trying to um, collapse the distance. This lab in Nairobi that we talked about earlier, those are local people. 
and they have the answer. But even then it doesn't stop. So journaling the experience of the people you're trying to serve, how's their day looking? So these experience journals, they then feed into what are we trying to do? Um, and what is a piece of technology that we do have as a global best practice that we can deploy here or should we invent something really from the ground up? Mobile money is a great example that was ground, ground, ground up and worked the other way around. So it's a bit of both diversity of background and thinking and then innovating close to the customer, wherever that might be. That is the approach. Um, how would you rate the level of technological innovation we're seeing in the fintech sector. As the original fintech, MasterCard probably has, has really great insight into not only what's happening here inside mm -hmm. your organization, but you know, innovation that's happening at startups and um, at, at, at partner organizations around the world. You know, compared to the innovation that we've seen in some other industries, do you, do you feel like um, innovation in fintech is, is holding its own? I think we are on the right track, broadly speaking. Um, I think there is openness um, for new technologies. There is openness for creating the right kind of framework around technologies. Why am I saying that? You see more and more regulators stepping in and saying we've got to break up the market to drive for innovation. There has to be a chance for newcomers coming in. We will watch that there isn't large companies that buy to kill when it comes to a new technology. All that, I think, is pointing in the right direction. If I, need to do, you know, if I wanted to lift out a few areas where I think we could do more, um, it's the point, for example, on general talent. The question that you just asked, where does you know, data scientist talent exist? Do we have enough of that in all the places where it matters? I think driving up the talent, particularly in the STEM, place, uh, in the STEM space, making sure you have gender diversity in that. You having you know, all sorts of people of all sorts of walks of life uh, represented, I think that's certainly one area. Another area is um, I find a whole point around data privacy and data exchange and how that works. For many you know, financial technologies, digital technologies, that's the fuel. Um, if you can't exchange it um, or it's exchanged in a loose manner that the individuals you know, don't even know about that, I think that's all problematic. And here, international coordination really matters. So you have a great fintech in one place, but you know, they want to serve the whole continent of Europe and people don't talk to each other across borders, then that's a problem. Not implying that's the case for Europe, but um, in fact, they're leading when it comes to regulation over there. Um, but I think that's, that's another space where, where I think more could be done. The fundamental question of broadband access that's where it all starts. And I think we have a very patchy landscape. So all the initiatives that are underway to drop internet from balloons and satellites, I think uh, w that's not what we do for a living, but we're very happy that that is uh, seen as a priority and that is being pushed and we lean in where we can. I wanted to ask you a little bit about cryptocurrencies and whether you have a point of view about whether cryptocurrencies and, and in some cases the removal of a, of a central bank is that good for financial inclusion? Will, will that expand opportunities for the underbanked? So there wouldn't have been a good conversation without talking about crypto. So I'm, I'm <laughs> great you raised it anyway. So uh, otherwise I could have asked you about that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a hot topic, no question. It's a vibrant topic. And uh, you know, what it can do and what it cannot do, uh, it's a pretty nuanced answer. It is not, yes, it's great or no, it's not great. When it comes to finan financial inclusion specifically, um, I think distributed ledger technology, blockchain, and digital currencies, they have a role to play. They have a role to play in many other use cases as well, as well but uh, specifically when it comes to payments, one has to really think about uh, this very, very carefully. Um, financial inclusion, oftentimes you are financially excluded if you're trying to make ends meet and you're not necessarily squarely in the middle class. Um, so currency stability is a real issue. Your hard-earned dollar, if that changes because you, you know, in value dramatically as you're trying to buy you know, critical goods and services for everyday life, that's problematic. So we, we have 
very categorically said, the likes of Bitcoin and other types of free-floating uh, cryptocurrencies is not useful for payments. It's, a, you know, it's an asset class, and that's great. We support people who want to invest in that and uh, spend those balances. That's, uh, so that, that's important. But then you think um, other types of digital currencies that have a link to value to a fiat currency, like private sector stable coins, central bank digital currencies, definitely very much they could play a role. Think about the complexities of cross-border payments, remittances. Oftentimes, in the case of financial inclusion, it's the relative somewhere across the border that is sending money to support the family back home. Can that be made easier? And this is where I think uh, uh, crypto can play a role. Simple questions of digital identity still need to be answered. Questions of data protection. FX and liquidity, those are questions that don't go away. And here's where your, your point about commercial uh, sector banks comes in. They do have a role to play. And I think the answer will be to f use all the power that crypto can bring, but make sure the last mile questions, the identity questions are solved. Um, and then I think uh, this can give us quite a boost in terms of productivity and usefulness. And, and who solves those problems, um, particularly as it pertains to um, you know, the, the, the underbanked or the underserved. I, is this an area that you think the, the market will address or will there need to be some regulatory guardrails? Um, a bit of both. I think when it comes to innovation, we're well served by the private sector driving that in a competitive setting so that the best solution shall win. Um, but you do need uh, regulatory guardrails. And we've seen this. Uh, there have been um, you know, private stablecoin undertakings for the last two years or so that haven't really gone anywhere because there is no firm regulatory framework at this point. So if you look, uh, you know, central banks around the world, they are opining on that. There's white papers being produced. The direction of travel goes into it's a two-tier system. The central bank is creating this uh, uh, this digital currency in the private sector uses it and distributes it. We believe that's the right model, but that has to turn into practice. And when that is turned into practice with policy, then the private sector can, so to say, knock itself out on innovation. Programmability of these uh, currencies, I think, is a way that will drive huge value. I, I want to come back to some policy questions in, in yeah. a minute or two, but you know, we have seen so many companies, large enterprises, undergo massive digital transformation during the last 15 months, that the pand yes. pandemic has necessitated companies yeah, yeah. embracing a digital transformation. You know, for, for MasterCard, I'd be interested in, you, know, you were already on that journey, but what have you accelerated as an enterprise? And then as a, as a payments network, how have you benefited from other organizations accelerating their digital roadmaps? Yeah, so you, know, you look at the last, uh, you know, 15 months. And what has happened here is really a, a time has been crunched. I think we have years of progress put into these 15 months. Why am I saying that? Because we were on a journey to digital transformation for the last five years at least. Uh, so this was happening and just it, it accelerated. And you see pockets of population that wasn't part of that journey. And there were countries that weren't really part of that journey. It brings it right, right back to the topic. So there was a, what you start to see in, um, in the last 15 months is this digital divide, not closing, quite the opposite, you know, opening a little bit further. Um, the folks that were in, um, that had access to digital solution, they were forced to use them uh, because there was no other option. So uh, digital payments kept the economy going. Um, you know, that's something we kept us really busy in the last 15 months. If you didn't have that opportunity, you were really excluded, much more than before. So that is something that we really need to overcome and need to lean into at this point. And that is, uh, you know, that is where we have these conversations with, you know, with the Aspen Institute. What do we need to do to make sure that we narrow the digital divide right now? Um, one of the ways of doing that is making sure that all these small businesses out there that might have been just brick and mortar now have a digital footprint. The big word of omni-channel with for big, big box merchants is a thing now needs to become a thing for small businesses. And we put a lot of tools out there. We took half a uh, quarter of a billion dollars and said, we need to support the SME sector over the next five years. That's going to be one thing that we need to do. So we need to lean in. One other thing that I would say is, 
In the crisis, um, the height of the crisis, second quarter last year, May, June, I was really happy that the digital payments industry kept the economy going. And those people who had access, they, they had the right kind of tools, but it was a reaction to a crisis. It wasn't the kind of user experience that you would really want. But now you have open-minded people. They tried something out. And you can really get it right now and say, let's really understand what they're trying to do, what they're trying to solve, and then involve these solutions, because there's a lot more open-minded open -minded now. The other thing that became even more crystallized during the last 15 months is the role of corporations as, um, in some cases, moral voices in other cases as sort of leading the charge on um, inclusion and, and, and other policies. I'd be interested to have you reflect a little bit on MasterCard's contributions to the conversation, the societal conversation over yeah. the course of the last 15 months. But then more broadly, like, is that sustainable? Um, and, and, and how do we get corporations to work with um, non-governmental organizations and, and governments to create systems of trust for consumers. Because right now it seems like the, the pendulum has swung a little bit and because consumers and citizens don't necessarily have faith in government, maybe don't necessarily have the same level of faith in, in non-governmental organizations, there, there's a burden on corporations that, that may or may not be, be well placed. I think you're right. Um, that, that is, um, you know, all what we have experienced in the last year. I, I think fundamental to what you just said is this point about trust. So you see the train going in the direction of this digital economy, and if there's no trust in that system, if there's no trust in technology, if there's no trust in rule, there's questions on transparency of business models or any of that, and those questions are, are, are certainly out there. I think it is up on uh, corporations to continue to raise their voice and make sure this goes in the right direction. But I think it's also important to realize guardrails cannot be set, set just by the private sector itself. I think that will actually not be trust enhancing. You need a partnership across the public sector and the private sector and non-governmental organizations in the middle. Um, you know, when, when I look at what we do with the Aspen Institute, since they are hosting this conversation, um, you know, we have a partnership on trying to create portable worker benefits. That's certainly trust enhancing. You could do all sorts of things with digital technology, but just imagine you had your dental benefit and your, your pension savings and everything on one app and you can take it from job to job. That is needed as, you know, people come back into the workforce after COVID. Wouldn't that be a good answer? No company by themselves can figure this out. It has to take you know, insurance companies, tech companies like ourselves, NGOs, and a government that endorses that. So we, we partnered uh, with um, seven cities across the U.S. to particularly target our efforts there and say, how do we drive an effort for more vaccination? How do we drive an effort for financial inclusion? You have a mayor uh, that, that said, uh, in this case, this is uh, Los Angeles, he said, I want to digitize all my city's services and deliver them at this point. And also, I got to pay out the stimulus payment and I want to pay out to these people that are unbanked. How do I do all of that? Cool solution came together called City Key that does all of this. This is, again, one of those examples where you have government, private sector, NGOs all coming together and say, I want to make a difference where it matters the most. If I had ever optimism that you know, is, it is the time where things are coming together, it is right now. And I think COVID has helped because the immediacy of the problem of leaving people behind is now really top of mind for pretty much everybody. Yeah. Sticking with policy and, and relationships with governments for, for another moment, you know, many other countries have a national financial inclusion policy. You know, is that something that the United States should consider and, and, and what should be part of a financial inclusion policy if, if that were a road that the U.S. were to go down? Yeah. So back to Middle East Africa, a decade ago, um, some of the countries I was working in, it was a national priority because it had to be. Um, and then, you know, how that, how that evolved over, over time was from a national priority to a program, laws, resource allocation, and so forth. You saw that in many countries. I think the United States would be well served to have that as a national priority. Uh, 
It's a dated number, but 2017, 8.4 million people were unbanked, completely unbanked. So if they get a paycheck, what do they do? They, do. they got to find somebody who you know, cashes that check. And percentages uh, that they take go up to 12%. So clearly, um, you know, unbanked matters here. Therefore, financial inclusion matters. And I, th I think putting up those guardrails uh, should be there. Um, I think it needs to be understood in a policy there if you're completely unbanked or if you're underserved. The, uh, the topic on credit access is, is important. How can you enhance that back to central bank regulations? You know, imagine all your data footprint, Stephanie, you could use that to get a higher credit score and therefore get a lower, um, lower APR or whatever you're trying to do. That would be a good thing. So I think thinking this through in its entirety, what are the identity questions that need to be resolved? So is there a portable digital identity that is easy to use for people? The workable benefits thing, those are all elements. It's a very holistic um, approach that is needed. I think that's what we've learned over the last 10 years. Um, we're leaning in. Uh, we've been partners with the Alliance for Financial Inclusion for years, starting to think about what that could look like and working with the government and uh, in conversations with the new administration, that's you know, a point of discussion, said more could be done and should be done and there's enough learnings. It's an optimistic note to end on. Michael yes. Meebach, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Stephanie.